Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor to welcome you today to the inaugural Queen's Annual Politics Lecture and to introduce you to our very distinguished speaker. The Queen's Annual Politics Lecture represents politics and international relations as an established and distinguished discipline at Queen's University Belfast, emerging into its own with the first chair in political science created in 1958 in what was then the Faculty of Economics. This lecture series will showcase cutting edge research by world leading scholars and practitioners whose expertise is widely disseminated and prominent in public discourses worldwide. In doing so, it will highlight their groundbreaking research and global engagement for the benefit of Queen's students and staff, the wider Northern Irish community, and a global audience. The lecture is generously supported by the R.M. Jones Memorial Lecture Fund in memory of Robert Miller Jones, who was born in Belfast in 1863 and died in 1948. He was a student of the Royal Belfast Academical Institution, where he later served as a principal from 1898 to 1925. And here at Queen's, where he became a member of the first Senate from 1908. And in that context, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you now to this year's lecture. James Robinson is the Reverend Dr. Richard L. Pearson, Professor of Global Conflict Studies and University Professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. He is also Institute Director of the Pearson Institute for the Study of Resolution of Global Conflicts. He was previously the Wilbur A. Cowett Professor of Government and also the David Florence Professor of Government at Harvard University. Professor Robinson is the author with MIT economist Darren Ajamoglu of Economic Origins of Democracy and Dictatorship, published by Cambridge University Press, Why Nations Fail, published by Crown, and most recently, the book on which today's lecture is based, The Narrow Corridor, States, Societies, and the Fate of Liberty, published by Penguin. He is also the co-editor of several books, including, among others, Africa's Development in Historical Perspective, published by Cambridge University Press, and Natural Experiments in History, published by Harvard University Press. Professor Robinson has been awarded several honorary doctoral degrees, and his many awards include, among others, the American Political Science Association's Heinz Ulaw Award for the best article published in the American Political Science Review, and also their William Riker Prize for the best book published in political economy. He has held the Florence Gould Fellowship at the Paris School of Economics, and he is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Robinson's research engages with enduring questions about why the world's fortunes diverge, questions that have animated scholarship from Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations to Barrington Moore's Social Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy. These are questions which in turn help us explain why liberty so often remains elusive as implied by the concept of the narrow corridor, the quest for liberty includes the treacherous task of transcending the Hobbesian state of nature while navigating between the Scylla of despotic government and the Charybdis 
of a society caged by stifling norms. And so, it is indeed a great pleasure to welcome Professor Robinson, albeit unavoidably in virtual form today, to deliver his Queen's Annual Politics Lecture on the Narrow Corridor. I'll hand over now to the Harris School and the University of Chicago's Professor James Robinson. Uh, good morning, uh, or good afternoon. I can't remember which one it is. Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm James Robinson, and, and uh, I'm very honored to be uh, giving the Queen's Annual uh, Politics Lecture, and I'm, I'm very sad I'm, I'm not doing it in person, of course. Uh, but we have to do everything virtually, but maybe the world will return to normal soon. So, so I'm very, I'm very honored to be there and I look forward to being back. I've been a couple of times to Queens and I, I very much look forward to coming back uh, in the future. So what I'm gonna do now is talk about uh, my most recent book with, with Daryl Asimoglu, uh, The Narrow Corridor. And, and, and let me just plunge straight into this and, 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 and you know, say, uh, there's different ways to motivate the book, but here's, here's one way to think about it, which is uh, humans want to live in liberty. Uh, and, you know, in some sense, I'm, I'm going to make two claims here, uh, one of which I think is maybe more contentious than the other, uh, uh, but, but, but we can discuss. Uh, so here's the first one, which I think might be a little bit contentious, uh, which is humans want to live in liberty. And what do I mean by liberty? Well, I mean, Here's a definition from John Locke's uh, second treatise. Locke said, you know, uh, what's liberty? Liberty is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions. So people want to live in a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit without asking leave or depending on the will of any other man. So this is a classic definition of, of what, you know, what we call kind of negative liberty nowadays. So, so people have liberty if they can organize their lives and their possessions without depending on the will of somebody else. Okay, so there's a definition of liberty. And the first claim is, you know, this is something people, this is something people value uh, in society. And I, I think the second claim, you know, is, is much less contentious, uh, which is, you know, there's a lot, you know, there's a large amount of variation in the world in the extent to which people enjoy liberty in this sense, okay? So what I'm gonna to do to start with is I'm just gonna sort of explore this variation. And in some sense, what's the book, what the book does is it presents a very simple way of thinking about, you know, it presents a very simple theory of this variation in the extent of liberty. And the theory helps us think about you know, why is it that liberty varies so much in the world today? And maybe what you could do about it. Okay, so, so let's, let's, let's with, that definition of liberty in, with that definition of liberty in mind, let's start thinking about, let's explore the variation a little, okay? So I th if I thought about the world and I thought about, you know, what's a society with illiberty? You know, wh where is this missing? Uh, what Locke defined as liberty, identified as liberty, where is that missing in the world, you know? And, 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 and it's obvious, I think, probably to everybody, that, that, you know, that one source of liberty is a situation, this is obvious to, this would have been obvious to Locke himself, uh, uh, one source of liberty or a situation which lacks liberty is where the state dominates society. So, so you know, so here's a here's you know here's an example that perhaps you might have been thinking of, uh, of modern China. Okay, this is in in Tiananmen Square. If you've been there recently, you know there's 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 hundreds of these face recognition cameras. In fact, the Chinese are putting up millions of these face recognition cameras all over the country. You know, when George Orwell wrote 1984, when he you know he talks about Big Brother is watching you, it wasn't technologically feasible for Big brother to watch you in the 1940s, but now it is. Big brother really is watching you now, okay? So, so this is not a situation of liberty in, uh, in Locke's sense. Uh, but obviously that's also not the whole story. Uh, not the whole world is like China or North Korea or Vietnam or places where the state dominates people like that. In fact, there are some parts of the world, here's an example, which is Yemen, where it's almost the other way around. Uh, 
here's a you know here's a scene in Yemen of young men. Uh, here's some beautiful mountain uh, villages behind them, and I just want to point out that that every man has a dagger in their belt. You know, in in Yemen. The state is a sort of cipher. There's hardly a state. And I'm not talking just now there's a civil war and the state has collapsed, but even before the civil war, the state was incredibly weak. I didn't control society. This wasn't a situation where the state dominated society like in China. In fact, it was almost the other way around. You can see every man is armed. Every boy, when they come of age, they get a dagger. And then they get different sorts of daggers and the daggers get bigger and different sorts of people have different sorts of dagger. And I like that just to show, you know, this is a situation where it's not power in the state dominating society. It's almost the other way around. You know, Max Weber, the great uh, famous German sociologist, one of the founders of modern social science, he, he defined a state, and this is a definition that you know, political scientists and sociologists and love and economists have come to love. He said, the state is that human community that successfully claims the monopoly of legitimate use of violence within a given territory. But actually in Yemen, it's not the state that has a monopoly of legit, what would you identify as the state which has a monopoly of legitimate violence. It's society, it's the people with the daggers, it's clans, it's lineage groups, it's, 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 it's uh, descent groups in society that have the monopoly of legitimate, the, the monopoly of violence, or well, they don't have a monopoly of violence, but they have the legitimate use of violence. This is the opposite of what Weber was talking about. So, so the first example of China was where the state dominates society. This is an example where society dominates uh, the state. And of course you might say, well, this is actually a much more representative you know, this might be what happens in Lebanon or in the DRC or in El Salvador. You know, this may be a more gen, this may be more, more kind of, this have, may have more explanatory power than, than the first model I talked about. Uh, whoops. Okay. So, but let me sort of focus a bit on what's going on in Yemen. I think it's a little more, it's a bit more complicated than the Chinese case. And in particular, the sources of illiberty. So in the Chinese case, the source of illiberty is pretty clear. But in Yemen, there's two sources of illiberty. Okay. One is, is a very Hobbesian one. You know, the, the, the subtext of Locke's second treatise, of course, is a kind of attack on Hobbes's theory of, of the state. Uh, and Hobbes said, you know, in a society without a state, you know, Yemen might be as close to that as you can get in the modern world. Uh, then you're going to have a situation of what Hobbes called war, you know, so Hobbes portrayed stateless society as a very anarchic uh, place with, you know, the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. So there's quite a lot of that going on in Yemen uh, too. Okay, so the absence of the state maybe didn't create war, but it certainly created a lot of violence and feuding well documented by anthropologists. Okay, but that's not the only source of illiberty in places like Yemen also, because society responds to reduce the potential for war. So this is not something that Hobbes really anticipated. He had a very kind of individualistic idea of society without the state, but this is not a, you know, it's, 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 it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a kind of community based or it's not, it's not so individualistic society in Yemen. There's strong families and descent groups and lineages, as I said, and lots of social institutions or norms are created, which actually reduce the potential for conflict and violence and, and, and illiberty, but they also restrict liberty in particular ways. So I think there's two sources of illiberty here, which, which I, which, you know, I'm not going to talk so much about this second one, unfortunately, but I just want to give you a flavor that, 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 there's more going on here just than, you know, than, than the Hobbesian war. Okay, so, so, so now you start seeing why liberty is difficult to create, you know, and why, why on the one hand, you know, if you have a situation where the state dominates society, that's not going to create much liberty. But on the other hand, you know, if you have a situation where society dominates the state, that's not going to create too much liberty either. Okay, so, so the idea of the book, and you know, that's, that's either for this Hobbesian reason or because you know, this, this, 
norms proliferate to kind of restrict the potential for Hobbesian conflict, but, but that creates what we call a cage of norms that doesn't deliver liberty either, okay? So, so the idea of the book and the title of the book is that it's somewhere in between where you have a balance between state and society. That's where liberty emerges. And this, 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 this place where this balance emerges, we call the narrow corridor, hence the title of the book. And this balance, this balance is difficult to achieve. Uh, and and that's, why, that's, why, that's why it's a narrow corridor. So if you could sum the whole book up in a, in a diagram, uh, you know, it, this would be it. Now, on the vertical axis, we're gonna, we call that the power of the state. So this is you know, the power of the state, the power to raise taxes, to regulate society, to control people. You know, so that's, that's something that China has a lot of. On the horizontal axis, we call this the power of society. So this is the ability of society to organize collectively, you know, to cooperate, to achieve goals, to identify goals. And so, 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 so we can, you know, I've been talking about the power of the state over society and the power of society over the state. So where is China? You could say China's on the vertical axis, sort of close to the vertical axis where the state is much more powerful than society. And Yemen is somewhere down here where society is much more powerful than the state. And in the middle, this thick black line is the corridor where the power of the state and the power of society are balanced. And it's one of the main themes of the book, actually, which is though the Chinese state may be powerful, we're going to call this a despotic leviathan, actually, in the middle where you manage to get this balance, something much more powerful with much more capacity uh, develops. So the Chinese state you know, has immense capacity in some dimensions, uh, but it lacks the cooperation and legitimacy, you know, lacks the cooperation of society. It can dominate society, but it can't get society to cooperate with it. And, and that's something that emerges, that synergy between state and society, we argue, in this narrow corridor. And that ultimately builds much stronger states and stronger society. So, so we have this terminology in the book, which, 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 you know, to try to sort of distinguish between these three different types of state, we say, you know, the Chinese has, using Hobbes' terminology, a kind of despotic leviathan. In the Ye case of Yemen, we call that a situation with a sort of absent leviathan. And in the middle, where this balance, in the corridor, what emerges is what we call a shackled leviathan. So, so it's, a, it's a sort of leviathan-like capacity to, to control and, and to, you know, to provide public goods or tax or regulate, but it's shackled in the sense of it's controlled by society, which is very different from the state uh, in China. Okay, so, so this diagram, you know, is, is sort of the whole, it gives you this idea of kind of the balance and these three different possibilities. And a lot of the book is trying to understand, you know, tap, kind of get in, dive into history and ask, you know, okay, like why did China end up like this? You know, and why did Yemen end up like this? And why did the societies that got into this corridor and moved along inside it, you know, and ended up with more shackled Leviathans, which here I'm identifying as Western Europe and North America. Why, why did that happen? And why didn't it happen in China? And, and why didn't it happen in Yemen? And, and I think a lot, the story that we have is, you know, this is not to do with big structural differences in the world. You know, lots of social scientists like you know, geography or the Chinese grew rice or the Europeans grew wheat or the Africans grew cassava, or, you know. So the story we have is not about so big structural differences like that. It's small differences in initial conditions. And, you know, the diagram sort of suggests that in the sense that countries which, or societies which, which can be very close to each other, but you can be inside or outside the basin of attraction of this shackled Leviathan, you could be inside or outside the corridor, that can be small, the differences can be small, but in the long run they have very large consequences. So let me tell you a little bit about that, just thinking through how come Europe ended up in the corridor, how come they managed to establish this balance between state and society, and how come China didn't, okay? So, the way we think about this is, you know, if you think about Western Europe, let's say, and you ask 
you know, where did this balance come from? The, we start the story, you know, at the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, what happened? The Western Roman Empire was taken over by Germanic tribes, Germanic tribes, the Goths, the Franks, and, and Tacitus, uh, the Roman historian in a book, a Germania, uh, it's almost an ethnographic book written, of course, several hundred years before the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. He talks about the Germans. He was very interested in the German tribes. The Romans couldn't defeat the Germans militarily. So they were very interested in understanding, you know, what was it about the organization of their society that made them so resilient? And here's, here's what he's saying. He's talking about the, the, the political institutions of the German tribes. And he says, over matters of minor importance, only the chiefs debate. On minor affairs, the whole community, the assembly is competent to hear criminal charges, especially those involving the risk of capital punishment. The same assemblies elect magistrates, those who administer justice, officials, etc. So Tacitus points, paints this picture of an extremely participatory assembly-based society. What happens at the collapse of the Roman Empire is the Germanic tribes with these very participatory institutions take over and merge with late Roman state institutions, administration, the church, uh, not so much fiscal in institutions. Uh, uh, and one of the great kind of political entrepreneurs who achieved that is King Clovis. Here he is on the left being baptized, you know, so him and his army converted en masse to Christianity to sort of co-opt the institutions of the church. And he started the Merovingian dynasty, okay? And what did the Merovingian dynasty, how were they organized politically? Well, they co-opted these Roman state institutions and they had assemblies. Here's the earliest written description we have of, of an assembly. It's quite a bit later than Clovis. But, but what's interesting about it is that it sounds very much like Tacitus. Uh, at that time, the custom was followed that no more than two general assemblies were to be held each year, etc. Okay, it, it's very much sim it's very similar to Tacitus's description of these Germanic assemblies. Now, one thing Clovis did was was he promulgated a law code called the Salic Laws, very famous uh, law code. And I want to emphasize he didn't write it; he promulgated it. So here's the here's the preface from one of the uh, existing copies. Again, it's a later copy of the Salic Law than Clovis's time. And it says, therefore, four men chosen out of many amongst them stood out. Wizogast, Arrogast, Salagast, and Widogast. You know, sounds like Lord of the Rings. They came from beyond the Rhine, Franks, Germans, beyond the Rhine, coming together in three legal assemblies and discussing the origins and cases carefully. They made judgment. So three legal assemblies, back to Tacitus, okay? So Clovis didn't write this law, these assemblies wrote the law, okay? And if you read the Salic law, it's a sort of codification of the norms and the customs of Frankish and Germanic society. It's not some top-down kind of micromanaging or controlling, it's a bottom-up process of codification, institutionalization of the norms of the German tribes. Okay, so 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 just kind of emphasizing the continuity here and this very participatory nature. Okay, so this model spreads. You know, it spreads. It spreads to England. Okay, uh, and 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 why? Well, the Saxons, the Anglo-Saxons. Who were the Saxons? The Saxons were Germans. Uh, Here's, you know, let me just give you one glimpse of this model spreading, which is a famous gl glimpse if you're English. With here, you know, uh, typical English overstatement. You're all used to that uh, in Ireland. The birthplace of modern democracy. This is Runnymede Meadow, where the Magna Carta was signed in 1215. Okay, so the Magna Carta, this famous sort of constitutional document that established some very basic uh, principles about the way the state should function in, in England. But I'm just going to tell you one thing about Runnymede Meadow. You know, this is West, West London. Uh, 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 it's a very historic place. Why did they meet in King John and the barons negotiated this Magna Carta? Why did they meet in Runnymede Meadow? You know, why? Of course, the pub might have been good at the background there, but why there? You know, why not? So, well, it turns out that Runnymede Meadow was a place where the Anglo-Saxon Witten had met. 
the Witten was the Anglo-Saxon version of these assemblies that, 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 that Clovis had, that Tacitus has observed. So they met there because that was the traditional place of accountability, of representation, of assembly, of debate. And it's a very deeply historic uh, place. And it shows the continuity you know, in, in 1215 between these Anglo-Saxon institutions and, and of course the Norman institutions. Okay, so so this is a long time ago, and this is you know creating this balance between state and society. It's not some sort of, it's not like constant. It's not like Solon, the lawgiver, comes and he rewrites Athenian law, and then he goes off. You know, he went off to to, to Turkey, you know, for ten years so that he wouldn't be tempted to rewrite them. No, this is a this is not a moment. You know, one moment. It's a struggle. It's a competition between the state and society. So if you know anything about the Magna Carta, you know that King John immediately got the Pope to annul it. And, you know, and there was a long conflict went on about the implementation of these things and 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 and, and so so and the institutionalization of representation through parliament and everything else. Okay. So so I want to sort of say you know, this once this balance gets emerges for quite idiosyncratic reasons, you could say, keeping it is not simple. It's a it's a contest. Okay. And and so what we do in the book is talk through in this European case, there's this deep history. We talk through the nature of this contest and the dynamics of this contest. And 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 again, let me just give you a little sort of a vignette about that, you know, from, from 18th century or early 19th century um, uh, Britain which is brilliantly analyzed by the historical sociologist, the great historical sociologist, Charles Tilly. So Tilly wrote a book uh, called Popular Contention in Great Britain. And what Tilly was interested in is something extremely relevant to, uh, to our book, which is the emergence of modern mass collective action. And he observed between the middle of the 18th century and the early 19th century, a very large change in the way people contested, okay, the, the way they contested with the state and the claims they made, okay, a new variety of claim making took shape, okay. Popular politics emerged on a national scale. Why? It emerged because, the expan because of the expansion of the state. After the Glorious Revolution in 1688, for the first time, the Brit Britain had a kind of really bureaucratized modern fiscal state kind of in your face regulating you taxing you so the state expanded and penetrated society in a way that had never happened before trying to control it and tax it and what happened society pushed back that's exactly what Tilly's talking about society got organized okay the expansion of the state pushed popular struggles from local arenas and from significant reliance on patronage towards autonomous claim making in national arenas. So Till is exactly talking about this struggle between uh, the state and society, which I was trying to describe. And here's, you know, here's, a, here's a picture from John, John Brewer's great book, The Sinews of Power, which describes a creation of this excise tax bureaucracy. And here's the excise rounds of Supervisor Cowperthwaite, you know, in, 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 in set in the early 18th century. Uh, what's he doing? He's going around, he's monitoring, he's, he's checking, he's making sure people aren't cheating and he's seeing how much the bread the baker is producing and how much beer the brewer is producing because they're going to tax it. And so this is the state and society reacts against the state. Uh, and, 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 and this competition is very key to our thinking. It's this competition that builds shackled Leviathan, it builds a stronger state and it builds a stronger society. So it's not an engineering problem. It's a it's, it's a contest and this contest, we call this the red queen effect. Okay. And, and, and if you want to build state capacity or you will, you know, this is what you have to, this is what you have to get going. Okay. So, so there's a story about, about, there's a deeply historical story. What about, okay. But what about China? I said, I was going to talk about some of these historical dynamics. Well, actually what's interesting about China is if you go far back in history, you know, let's go back before the rise of the Qin dynasty, before the rise of, you know, of, 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 of this despotic Leviathan in China. It doesn't look so different. Here, you know, here's a famous book, uh, intellectual, post-Confucian intellectual work uh, from, the, from the Warring States period, the Hunzi. And I, you know, I, one of my Chinese friends did, translated this for me, but, but let me, so here's, I thought it's rather cute with the Chinese characters. Let's, let me just go through what this, this is a very famous Confucian, treatise, you know, it's a philosophical treatise, but it's also about 
society and governance, you know, Confucius was very interested in, in how society should be governed and state society relations. And here's, what does it say? The king is a boat. The common people are the water. The water holds up the boat or the water can sink the boat, okay? So the king is the boat. He's being held up by the ordinary people. The people can keep him afloat or they can sink him. What's that? It's popular accountability, okay? So, so the Hunzi paints a picture of accountability. This is pre, you know, pre Qin dynasty, uh, but, but, but accountability. Then, then what happens? Well, a new model emerges in the late warring states period. Here's one of the great kind of intellectual founders of that model, Shang Yang. And in his, we, we, you know, he, we have a, he's a sort of Chinese Machiavelli, if you like, uh, uh, written, you know, uh, 1,800 years before Machiavelli. Uh, but it's a very sophisticated analysis of problems of government and how to build a state. This is from a quote, quote from his existing writings that we have. And he says, when the people are weak, the state is strong. Hence the state that possesses the way strives to weaken the people. So the way, you know, Tao, this is the, you know, this is virtue and the cultivation of virtue. This is, this is your objective. Uh, this is a Confucian objective. Uh, when the state is, when the people are weak, the state is strong. Hence the state that possesses the way, virtue, strives to weaken the people, okay? So, so this is the Chinese model. You know, this is the people are weak, the state is strong. When the people are weak, the state is strong. You have to weaken the people. That was the strategy of the Qin dynasty. And it's kind of been the strategy more or less ever since in China. Uh, you know, why are they putting all those cameras everywhere? Well, they're implementing what's called the social credit system. Here's the social credit system is this incredible monitoring of your behavior, your activities, what you buy, what you look at on your telephone, where you go, on which bus and which train, which job do you do, what does your boss say about you, who do you talk, to? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's Big Brother is watching you. And if you're a good citizen and don't say bad things about the Communist Party, then you get access to preferential access to things. And if you don't, you can't buy a train ticket and they shut your phone down and it's a very scary, you know, but Lord Shang would have approved. Okay, so, so, so that's, you know, that's, that's the way we think about how, why did that emerge when, when things don't look so different historically in China? You know, that's a, it's an intellectual revolution. It's more like a, you know, a model of state emerges and it's militarily victorious. And then it creates this enormous momentum. It creates these dynamics that create this despotic Leviathan. Once you're in that equilibrium, that's something very, very difficult uh, to get out of, okay? So, so, and in fact, once you start thinking about that and the creation of illiberty in this um, despotic Leviathan, you sort of see, you know, why you might end up with something like, like Lebanon. Because when you study societies like Lebanon, I haven't studied Lebanon much myself, but many places in Africa, which I have studied and I have done research on, you see, it's somehow the anticipation of the creation of a despotic leviathan, which keeps, you know, which keeps, a, a, which keeps you in a situation where there isn't really much of a state. In most ethnographically observed stateless societies in Africa, for instance, it's very clear that one of the forces that keeps society sort of stateless, that blocks the creation of more centralized authority, is exactly the anticipation that this authority will be used despotically. That's something that John Locke would have understood. You know, Locke was exactly arguing, you know, against Hobbes saying, you know, why would you expect this Leviathan that you suppose, you know, should be created to behave in the collective interest? Locke just didn't believe that. And that would resonate with many Africans I know, you know. So, so once you see this Chinese dynamic and the mechanism underlying it, this idea that, you know, the state has to weaken society, the state has to dominate society, it's the anticipation of that, that dynamic getting going that sort of keeps a society like Yemen in the situation they're in. Uh, I wasn't gonna 
you know, I'm not a scholar of Yemen, so I'm, I, I, I usually like to, we discuss this in the book in a different case in the, from, the, from, from southeastern Nigeria, which is a part of the world I know much better, uh, which is the, 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 the Tivland, uh, which is, uh, um, uh, we know, without, this is one of these ethnographic maps which should be used with enormous uh, caution. But Tiv, the Tiv people roughly live in this brown area. Here's the Benue, here's Makurdi. Uh, and this is the Benue, the river Benue. The Tid people live in, you know, southeastern uh, Nigeria. So that's that's true, but the, the map wouldn't take the map much seriously <laughs> otherwise. Uh, but just to give you a sense of where the Tiv are. And what's interesting about the Tiv is, you know, the Tiv, the Tiv was a large, you know, was a very large, there are millions, there are millions of Tiv people today. But it's not a sort of small scale society like the you know, like the sand people in the Kalahari or the Hadza in Tanzania. This is a big, like the Pashtuns or the Igbo, you know, just south of the Tiv. Big society, you know, language, religion. Uh, it was a segmentary lineage society. So, so, so Tiv people, you know, can all recount their ancestry back to a, to a kind of mythical ancestor, but they had no centralized authority in the pre-colonial period. And what's interesting about the Tiv is that it's been very, except, you know, apart from I know something about it myself, is that it's been, it was very well studied in the 1940s and 1950s by two anthropologists, Paul and Laura Bohannon. And they were particularly interested in uh, this issue of statelessness. And why was it that the TIV was stateless? You know, to, to an economist, you sort of say, well, of course you need a state, there are public goods, you can't, you know, you can't provide them. Uh, you know, without centralized authority to tax and provide, you know, because people have free, there are free rider problems. And, you know, so we can paint a, a situation, not quite of Hobbesian war, but of certainly inefficiency without centralized state authority. Okay. But what the TIV were worried about was exactly this issue of, uh, of dominance that I described. I, I, maybe I shouldn't talk about this too much. Bohannon tells a story you know, of, of, I'll tell you a, one of Bohannon's photograph of a Tiv diviner. So here's a Tiv diviner. In his left hand, he's, he's got a fly whisk, okay? And so, 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 you know, what Bohannon points out is that, you know, somebody who started getting too big for their boots or started becoming powerful or was immediately accused of, uh, you know, using witchcraft, essentially. And a diviner, you know, if you want to find out if somebody has been using witchcraft against you, you hire a diviner and the diviner, you know, uses this, this fly whisk to sort of detect uh, witchcraft or the use of witchcraft. And so Bohannon kind of points out, the Bohannons point out that men who acquire too much power, you know, if you want to have a centralized state, you have to start delegating authority to people. People have to start kind of telling other people what to do and organizing things. And, and people who acquire too much power were whittled down by means of witchcraft accusations. Nyambua, so he's talking about, about a particular kind of religious cult which, which was connected to these witchcraft accusations. Nyambua was one of a regular series of movements to which Tiv political action with its distrust of power gave rise to so that the greater political institutions, one based on the lineage system and the principle of egalitarianism can be preserved. So I, I, I bold here, I bold face distrust of power. Okay, so, 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 so it's distrust of power that stops hierarchy or, or centralization emerging. That's, that's, so it's exactly the anticipation that if you sort of create hierarchy, it's going to be abused and it puts you on this slippery slope to a despotic Leviathan that kept the Tiv stateless in the pre-colonial period. That's exactly what, uh, that's exactly what Bohannon uh, argued. Okay, so so now we come now we have, so I'm giving you a sort of little flavor of some of the mechanisms here, the mechanisms that can create a despotic leviathan that create this dominance of state over society. But in some sense, it's the anticipation of that mechanism which 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 creates a situation where society dominates the state. And you can see now how difficult it is to find a balance. You know, how do you find a balance between tipping over towards one side or the other? And that's the problem of getting into this narrow corridor and staying in uh, the narrow corridor. And that's 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 really what what the book is about. And 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 you know what's what's some implications of this? You know what's you could say uh, uh, what's some other implications? Well, one thing I sort of anticipated, which is you know 
Uh, Lord Chang is not is wrong, actually. You know, it's not true. You know, he says when the state dominates, you know, when the state is strong, the people are weak. And when the people are weak, the state is strong. Actually, in this framework, that's not true. I mean, it's true that the state is stronger in China than it is in Yemen or Nigeria. But it's not true that that's where the state is strongest. In fact, our argument, remember, in the narrow corridor, when this Red Queen effect gets going, you actually create stronger states and stronger society. So actually, there's not a trade off if you can get this Red Queen effect dynamic going. Why is that? Why do states become stronger in the corridor? Because you have the cooperation of society and society is willing to kind of concede things, concede taxation, concede authority to, to cooperate. And that actually makes the state stronger. There's, only, there's limits to how much state capacity you can accumulate in this despotic way. So I think that's, that's, a, that's an interesting implication of the framework. Okay? You can see also, and I think this is, you know, when I, you know, I'm old enough to have lived through the collapse of the Berlin Wall, and, you know, and the famous uh, forecast, you know, that history had ended and all societies were going to converge to liberal democracy. You know, that's a very odd claim for someone who studies history. You know, the big pattern in history is divergence. You know, if you think about this, what I talked about China, you know, this is, this is two and a half thousand years of divergence. What about Yemen? Well, we know quite a bit about Yemen, you know, because, because there was writing, there was, there was, we don't know so much about Tivland, you know, or southern, eastern, southeastern Nigeria, because we don't have really have written records going very far back. But 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 in Yemen, we know we have we we have written records going back one and a half thousand years. We know a lot about that history of Yemen because of, we had Arabic and we have writing, we have the Quran, you know, we have we have etc. So 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 we know that that's that's been a pretty stable equilibrium in Yemen also for a long time. So, so, so the, you know, that, 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 that there's no natural process of conversion in institutions in the way. There's very powerful mechanisms creating this divergence. And it's not gonna be eradicated by modernization or any of these other mechanisms that political scientists sometimes like, okay? So divergence is the thing and, and, and that's powerfully reproduces itself over time, okay? You know, something I emphasize here that Creating this shackled Lafayette is not just, it's not about designing some constitution or, you know, designing some elaborate institutional architecture, okay? It's, society has to get involved. It's not an engineering problem. It, it's, it's a contest. It's like, you know, like, what, what is it in the United States that, that ultimately has sort of kept democracy, kept the institutions on the road, you know, in the last six months where President Trump was trying to basically overthrow them? It's the prospect of people collectively opposing that and making sure that the right decisions get made. I think that's what kept the institutional architecture was important, but the institutional architecture has to be defended by, by people. Otherwise, other people like President Trump have incentives to overthrow it. So I think it's been a vivid kind of, you know, it's been a vivid, it's vividly demonstrated this argument here, I think. Okay. Uh, I didn't talk much about the cage of norms. You know, I sort of hinted at, you know, there's other sources of a liberty in a place like Yemen or indeed uh, Southeastern Nigeria about the types of norms, you know, that society proliferates to deal with this situation of statelessness. And that's a source of a liberty as well, but I didn't talk too much about that. So I'll just, I'll just sort of put that out there. Uh, and I do, let me just say one more thing to, you know, to end with, I said, I said, you know, the, the sort of two claims at the start, one might be more contentious than the other, you know. Uh, one is, you know, that everyone values liberty in this Lockean sense. So you could say, well, that's a very kind of parochial Western claim, you know, like in some sense, this notion of liberty and, you know, that's a very, that's coming out of a very kind of Western tradition of political development or the development of political thought and political theory, you know, Chinese political thought uh, was very different, you know, Middle Eastern political thought was very different, you know, if you think about the Islamic State and the constitution of the Islamic State, you know, uh, that was about implementing the Sharia, you know, God had revealed the law to, to people, and, and, and the state's job was to implement the Sharia and to make sure people lived according to these rules, you know, that's a very different notion of, of the, na the nature of the state in Western society. So I think there are important cultural differences in, you know, the way people think about the world, 
you know, and the problems they face. And there's also, you know, much more collectivist societies than, than in the West. You know, I work a lot in Africa. I know African society. African society is sort of individualistic and collectivist at the same time, I always think. But, but I'm just sort of pointing out here that I think we ought to interrogate whether liberty, you know, it, it, you know, it, 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 is that something everybody wants or is that some very kind of Western notion of like what we value, some very individualistic, uh, I think that's worth discussing. Uh, uh, and I guess, you know, the claim in the book, you know, which I sort of said this may be more contentious, uh, is, is, is actually people do worry about liberty. You know, everyone worries about liberty. The TIV, people in the TIV society in Africa, they worry about liberty. In fact, you know, the argument I gave about, you know, TIV political institutions was the TIV didn't have a centralized state because they were so worried about liberty and their liberty being eradicated. Okay. And in China, you don't have much liberty, but the claim here is people don't like that. People are aware of it and people are unhappy with that, but they're stuck with it. Okay. So again, that's an empirical claim. You could say other people say, no, no, Chinese people think that they have a legitimate political system. And, you know, I think that if that were true, the Chinese government wouldn't have to spend so much resources monitoring and controlling people and censoring. But again, that's, that's an empirical claim, you know, that should be discussed. I'm just kind of pointing out here, you know, that, that this is the claim in the book. You know, we could argue, I think reasonable people can disagree about that. And, and but, but I'm just, you know, we're trying to claim here that actually Western liberty is not due to anything kind of specifically advantageous about Western society or anything else. It just so happened that the West was lucky that it had the initial conditions that put it on this particular path of political development. And the initial conditions in Yemen or Africa or China were different. And of course, you know, I haven't got time to start talking about it, but you know, if I wanted to talk more deeply about the path in Africa, uh, you know, the path would involve all sorts of perverse interactions with the rest of the world, you know, the slave trade, which devastated southern Nigeria, colonialism, the Cold War, dictated, you know, so, so there's a lot more things to talk about just than this argument about the nature of TIV, traditional TIV society. I'm just giving you a sort of flavor of this, you know, so, so you could say, you know, my last, my last point, I guess I'm making is, you know, the illiberty of a lot of the world is not unconnected to the liberty in uh, the Western world and certainly not in uh, Britain, you know, which was so heavily involved in the slave trade and, and the, the kind of uh, devastation of much of the colonial world. So I don't, I don't want to belittle that. I, that's part of the big story. There's only so much I can get into in 40 minutes. Anyway, I'll shut up now and, 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 and thanks very much for, for, for your attention.